Okay, good morning, everyone. How are you this morning? Okay. My name is Anika Daniels Osaze, and I am the director of the Office of Diversity, Education, and Research in the College of Medicine. And I'd like to welcome all of you here to our annual Cultural Competency and Health Disparities Conference. So today we're going to talk about some important issues that you need to be aware of when um, considering a career in healthcare. The best way to treat your patients in the, the most equitable form in the um, the healthiest form is to know more about them and to respect their culture. And although that sounds like it's very simple and it sounds like it's something that we could do without thinking about it, quite often patients are not given the kind of care that they need because they are misunderstood, they are misrepresented, they are underinsured, they are not treated equitably based on um, their cultural differences. And some of that is done unintentionally, some of it is intentional. So it's important for us to try to be as knowledgeable as possible and do everything we can in our power to avoid doing anything that could be harmful to our potential patients. Or if you're someone who's entering research to make sure that you're doing the most um, ethical research that you can possibly do. So today we have a series of speakers and, of, and activities for you to get involved in. I'm going to start off by introducing you to the Associate Dean of the College of Health Related Professions here at SUNY Downstate, uh, Dr. Margaret Kaplan. Now she uh, herself is in the field of occupational therapy, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, but the College of Health Related Professions actually has several different fields that it encompasses. The physical therapy field, physician assistants, occupational therapy, midwifery, diagnostic medical imaging, medical coding, and um, medical informatics. So there are a lot of fields that you may be considering in addition to medicine and research, and these issues are just as critical in this college as well. So at this point, I'm going to have Dr. Kaplan talk to you today, and our focus will be on disabilities and health disparity. Thank you, Dr. Kaplan. Thank you, Dr. Daniel Osage. Thank you. Um, so I'm an occupational therapist. Who knows? Does anybody know what that is? Anybody ever met one? Now you have. <laughs> Here I am. Occupational therapist. Everybody knows what a physical therapist is. Anybody? Yeah? Okay. So occupational therapists, a lot of, about almost half of them work with children. And that's, I've worked with children my whole, my whole career. Um, since the school here in the 70s. And this building wasn't even here. But in the past, um, occupational therapists work mainly with people who have difficulty in um, participating and following through on things that they need to do in their life. So daily activities, dressing, bathing, cooking, shopping, all those kinds of things, child care, um, work, getting to work, doing work, um, you know, getting transportation, getting around the community, all of those kinds of um, functional daily things that you all do without thinking really about it. Um, people with disabilities and other health impairments may have trouble doing. So visual therapists kind of are specialists at looking at what is limiting the person, how could we um, change the person, how could we change the environment, how could we accommodate for that issue, that impairment, that condition that they have so that they can go to school, whatever they want, go fishing, I don't know, you know, play basketball, whatever that they, that they want to do, take care of their baby. Um, so that's occupational therapy. You can think about it if you like for your future, but um, we have an excellent program here. Um, but today, um, I'm going to talk about disability, and really that's um, what I've been doing my whole, my whole career. And what you find with disability is that it, it, is a, it, uh, it interacts with a lot of the social determinants of health um, and produces really remarkable health disparities for, for people. So let's talk about... What is disability? What's a disabling condition? There are lots of definitions. I didn't write down all the definitions for you. 
assuming that you wouldn't want to read them. It's, it's boring. But one of the main definitions is from the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA. Anybody heard of that? Yeah. The ADA in 1990 um, was landmark. It had some revisions over the years, but it was landmark civil rights legislation. So saying that you could not discriminate against somebody on the basis of a disability. Um, it's a little remarkable to me that we had to wait until 1990 to get um, civil rights legislation for, to protect people with disabilities, but we did. And the American with Disabilities, Americans, I should have written, Disabilities Act, defines um, limitations and disabilities. And their main, um, one of the main aspects of definition of who has a, who qualifies as a person with a disability to be protected under this law um, are people who have trouble with major life activities. So those are just a few of them. Um, the World Health Organization has a, a larger kind of view, maybe because it's World Health Organization, I don't know, but it, it looks um, at people with disabilities as pe are people who have trouble in, their, in life situations, so have trouble participating in work, trouble participating in there was someone behind me, right? And then they disappeared? OK, great. <laughs> um, thank you. <laughs> um, somebody who has trouble participating in education, um, play, social, family life. Um, the, the, before we get to this, Medicare, insurance, Medicaid have their own definition. Social Security have their own very, very specific definitions. So you don't qualify unless you have, you know, you have this certain level of trouble with participating. So it's not just any old trouble, but it has to be a certain level of trouble. Then, you're, then you may um, qualify for Medicaid or Social Security, things like that. So let's just think about a disability, given those definitions. Does somebody, who know, everybody knows what diabetes is. All right, it's a medical condition. It, can be managed. Does anybody here have diabetes that they care to share? Have young friends with diabetes? Childhood onset diabetes. You can live perfectly well and very healthily with diabetes. If, how do you, what do you have to do to, to monitor your own diabetes? Hmm? Right, you have to, really monitor your glucose levels consistently, meticulously, and monitor your diet and um, other inter pharmaceutical interventions, et cetera, if you need them. So would somebody with diabetes have a disability? Do we call that as somebody with a disability, a person who has diabetes? I have a no up here. Any other, any other votes? I, I need the clickers. Um, anybody say yes? Okay, so it's a trick question. I, I think it's a yes. Okay, it's a trick question because it doesn't, depends. I do this to the students all the time. Is it that, what, what is this? And I go, well, it depends. Right, and you're right, and you're right. Sometimes, if somebody isn't um, able to take care of their diabetes and follow it consistently and follow the diet that you have to follow and take the medication and do follow-up visits, what can happen? What do you get if you don't manage your diabetes? Anybody know anybody with diabetes? That's not possible. It's like the major medical condition in Brooklyn? Neuropathy, where it can spread to your Okay, yeah, it can, it can affect your neurological system, it can affect your circulation. So neurological and circulation, if you lose feeling, often it's in people's extremities first, 
You lose feeling and your circulation isn't so good. Are you walking around a lot and exercising? You can't feel your legs. You have trouble walking. So what can happen, you can get um, infections, things like that in your extremities. And you could, if not taken care of, you can end up with amputation. So it could be a disabling condition. It could result in a disabling condition. However, there are many, many people in this world, in this country, and elsewhere that have diabetes and have it all their lives and manage it perfectly well and do not have a disability. All right, would not be considered having a disability. Does that make sense? Um, so how about somebody who has one leg? Do they have a disability? Yeah. Right, it depends. <laughs> You'll learn. It depends. What does it depend on? Right, so did they lose their leg and have enough access to health care so that they had good rehabilitation with physical therapy and occupational therapy and they got a really good thesis that fits well and you can't just hand somebody an artificial leg and stick it on there. It needs follow-up. It starts to, your leg changes. It needs modification. You have to be back and forth to taking care of that medically with taking care of your prosthesis. So if you have enough health care and health access, you could have a good prosthesis. And nobody would probably, you wear a pant leg over that, no one would know that you have an artificial leg on the side. So would you have a disability in that case? No. You would be doing all your life activities without a problem. And that actually run. run? Right. Do you have to run in order to do all your life activities? I would say no. I would say, do you really have to be able to run? Probably not. Could you do other things than running? So maybe not. The one per but is that a disability? Not unless it might be a disability if the person wants to do track and field competitively. Right. Only, but if then they might be experiencing disability, and it would depend on what system you're trying to show disability in. If it was Medicaid, Medicaid would say no, no disability here. Um, Social Security would say no disability here. Person's fine. They're doing everything. They can work. They can go to school. They can take care of themselves at home. They don't need any. They're fine. However, World Health Organization would say qualifies maybe as a person with a disability in that one little in that one area. All right, but what I'm saying is that we want to think about not, we, wa we don't want to think about disability as the same thing as a medical condition. Lots of us have medical conditions that are not disabling. They're not preventing us and limiting us in things that we want to do in our lives. Um, how about a um, limited hearing? Anybody here have limited hearing? hearing aids on both ears. Um, if it got worse, it might be a little disabling, but it's not. It's a medical condition, and you want to make sure it's not getting worse and have follow-up and get accommodations, which are hearing aids, in my case, and you want to remember to use them and put them on and give somebody if they don't work. But a hearing impairment doesn't necessarily prevent you from doing what you want to do in your life activities. If it is, then we could look at that as a disabling condition, but it shouldn't be. With access to health care and good health care, it should not be. Um, so disability is not the same thing as a medical diagnosis. So People, the same diagnosis, some people could, could be considered quite disabled, and other people may not be considered. And people in the deaf community 
could, many people will very offended if you talk about them as disabled. They do not consider themselves disabled because they can do anything that they want to in their life. They have communication methods. There's technology to fill in when they need it. Um, and they can work, go to school, play, etc. So you want to be careful about thinking about medical conditions as disability, necessarily. Um, if there's a, a, a side issue of um, the disabilities we've talked about are more or less visible, although you can't see diabetes, but you see someone without a leg, you see somebody in a wheelchair, you can see differences in how people do things. But there are a number of hidden, people call hidden, hidden disabilities that are not visible, um, that can present some problems for those people in healthcare access and in their, and their in the healthcare that they receive once they have access. Um, what kind of things, if you had a learning disability or a mental health disorder, mental disability, how might that affect your ability to access health care? able to properly convey what you want. So it's um, just design, um, sorry, you're relying on another person uh -huh. for your health care. Yeah. So having that middle man. That's a really important, if you're going to be health care people or any kind of human service, whatever you end up with dealing with people, if somebody comes in, if they need either an interpreter sometimes or they have a a care assistant to help them get the wheelchair up and down, or just, you know, they maybe have somebody with dementia and they can't find their way, so they've got someone with them. <coughs> Lots of reasons. What it, people tend to um, talk to the assistant rather than the person with, that's coming for health care. Why would that be? So I'm sitting in the wheelchair and the person with me and the doctor's talk or the receptionist or anybody is talking to the person with me rather than me. Why would that be? Believe me, we do it. It happens constantly. Well, we make some assumptions, yes, about disability. Yes, we make a lot of different. We all make assumptions about disability, and they're all different, probably, from each other. But we all make assumptions about disability. If someone has trouble talking, we often conclude that they they don't think, and they don't understand, like a child. Or if someone has trouble walking, we're going to talk to the person who walks, or the person who's at our level. Or, uh, but it happens a lot. Yeah, what were you going to say? Mm -hmm. So then, therefore, like page, uh, doctors or like the people who would actually be doing some other type of they communicate with the family to see how they do it. So yeah, and and we need to communicate with family and caregivers. We must, <laughs> in the interest of the the person that they're taking care of and helping, definitely. But we want to make sure that we're talking to the the person with the disability. And it gets into a different area than what I'm talking about, but the whole um, subject area or interest 
area of um, interpreters and caregivers. And if you don't speak the same language as the person you're taking care of, um, and you, you ask the person with them to interpret, and they say, yes, I, can I speak both languages, I can interpret. Um, can you rely on the fact that, you're, that the patient, the person with the medical or limiting condition, will tell you everything if this person with them has to interpret? Often we ask very personal questions. Will they tell everything if somebody else is there, especially somebody from family? What if you're asking about sexual habits or sexual um, past? Will they tell you everything if there's a person there from their family who may not know everything about them and may not approve? You will? No, you won't. Believe me, you won't. So there's an issue with using interpreters especially family, people from your community, you know, and, and when you're asking people about personal things. So we want to just keep that in mind. But um, people who don't look like they have a disability but have special needs are in a position of having to lobby for themselves at the doctor's office or the rehab center or the, the clinic the emergency room, because no one sees that they, that they need some special help. Um, so somebody might say to you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here, I have this, but I have um, X syndrome. Ooh, okay. First of all, you have to know what that is to, to be confident in what you're doing. And second of all, which you can look up really quickly now, um, but second of all, do we know what a person with fragile X, does that interact with their medical condition they're coming to you for? Um, so we have to think about some of these things that we might not see right off the bat, but that might be impacting on health conditions. Um, and we need to know where to look things up, how, where to go to get information for the patient about how their particular developmental disability interacts with their diabetes, et cetera. Um, so, given what we've been talking about, what, what, do you, what would you say the problem is here? What's the problem? There's no ramp. Okay, there's no ramp that we see anyway. Right. Any, any other, hmm? Or any other way of getting up the steps? Anybody else have an idea what the, there's probably multiple problems here. So an, an assistant, a um, lot of steps. I got a really strong assistant to get that wheelchair and that woman up those steps. But yes, there's nobody with her to help. Anything else? Is there any problem with her? A lot of people. You're you're really exceptional the people who said something. I don't know about the rest of you. Don't say anything. You might be exceptional. But a lot of people would say the problem here is that she's in a wheelchair. So the problem that she can't get up the stairs is hers, is in her, that she's got a condition that doesn't allow her to be able to walk, whatever that is, a spinal cord injury, whatever it is. Um, so a lot of people would look at this and say, the problem here is her. She's in a wheelchair. She can't get up the stairs. Several of you automatically thought, oh, the problem is that there's no ramp. And that's exactly how we want, I think there's success here in this world. Because we've been trying disability groups and medical people been trying for years to get people to think that about the environment as an issue, not just the person as an issue. They need to learn to walk, or they need this, or they need that. They're, you know, they can't do it. But in this case, there's no way for her to get up the stairs, but there could be if there was what we call an accommodation. 
or in universal design stairs. So there's a, an example over there of a, a design of, of stairs somewhere where you need lots of stairs, but they designed it and built it with a ramp built into the stairs. So does that, is that made just for people with wheelchairs? Who else might be helped by that kind of design when there's lots of stairs? Yeah, stroller. Man, hopefully you haven't been wheeling around your own strollers, but you've been wheeling around other people's kids' strollers, and when you get rid of that stroller, it's a wonderful day, believe me. I retired the stroller from my children, and I said, you're walking now. I can get into any store I want. Wherever I have to go, you will walk. Um, it's wonderful, but when you have a stroller, if you have a couple of kids in a stroller, it's even more. Bags of shopping in a stroller with the kids. To get up those stairs is, is very, you see people in the subway trying to get in and out of the subway with stairs with strollers. This will help people with strollers. Anybody else? <laughs> yeah, so p somebody who's using a cane or a walker, they're walking, but they're, they're having a little trouble with balance. They're, they may have trouble with that many stairs trying to get up, and walking up a ramp is easier. Shopping cart, anything like that. Can your dog, a dog with little short legs. Um, point is, universal design is helpful to everyone, or many, many people. Um, little children sometimes don't want to go up all those stairs. They think the ramp is fun. Um, so. Universal design is, is sort of an accommodation, but it's, but it's when you build something with everyone in the community at m in mind and not just the majority of people. Um, what's this thing? Here's a, a wheelchair that can go up and down stairs. It's a power wheelchair. It weighs a ton. Nobody can help you move that thing up and down stairs. If it, if it breaks down, you're stuck. You can't get anywhere. All right, not up and down stairs. And somebody could push it, turn it off, and put it flat. But um, but if you have a chair there, and there are several types. That's not the only one. But there are chairs that can go, chairs that can go up and down stairs. What's the problem there? You think? Yes. 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 It's a, it's like expensive car. That most of us don't have. Did they? Yeah. Oh, tut tut that on them. Great. Airlines are getting in a lot of trouble lately, aren't they? I know. Um, Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance is not going to cover this wheelchair. So, if you're uninsured and you don't, you're not eligible for Medicare. You're not going to get this wheelchair anyway, but if, certainly if you have a, are low income and paying on your own, you're certainly not going to get it. If you are wealthy um, or have private you know, backers, <laughs> people who, who have money, who know you, um, sometimes people do fundraising. Community groups do fundraising and get something like that for, for somebody in their community. So there are certainly ways to get it, but, but it's not something that's covered for everybody. But there are things like this available. Um, what the gentleman's using in the, the top corner, left corner, is um, a program called ZoomText, and there are a number of computer programs that can help people who, in his case, he's got very low vision. Um, it's not helpful to somebody who's blind, obviously, because they couldn't see it. But if you have low vision, you generally um, can only magnify the, the um, print so much with the features that come on Microsoft um, you know, and on the computer. You can, you can magnify font, you can change font, you can do things like that. But what Zoom Text does is make it even bigger for a person and, and scroll is right? Because the more you magnify the text, the f less fits on the screen. You have to be able to scroll back and forth very easily to be able to read anything. Um, and so there are a number of electronic um, computer-based 
accommodations that somebody could use to get through school, to do the reading they need to do for school, to train for a profession, and get a job and do their job. So what we mean by accommodations are things that don't rely on changing the person or fixing the person or curing a medical condition, but on um, changing the environment in which they have to do something so that the environment is more, um, it makes it, it's a more feasible environment for them to function in. Um, okay. It's worth to think about with in, in terms of disability as a as a disability as an underserved group, disability as a minority group, disability as a group that gets discriminated against. Um, that disability interacts with employment. So, are people with disabilities less likely to be employed than people without disabilities? Yes. Um, are people with disabilities less likely to have um, access to the best education than people without disabilities? Yeah. Are, so if you're not working, what's your income like for most of us? Low. You're likely, much more likely to be low income if you have a disability than if you don't have a disability. Um, if you are unable to get in and out of your house or it's very difficult because there's stairs and you can't go up and down stairs, we have difficulty with that, is your social environment limited? Yeah, there are fewer people with disabilities who have internet access than among people without disabilities. So there, that impacts also on your social environment. Um, so there are lots of things that um, disability um, interacts with that produce health disparities that we see. Um, so disability interacts with income, I talked about that. Often people who, are, um, who have a recognized disability by Medicaid are eligible for Medicaid in order to get health care only because their income is under a certain level and it's a fairly low level. I don't remember what exactly it is, but it's a, it's a low level. If that person with a disability train, goes to school, trains for a job, and gets a job, and that job does not offer health insurance, and they're, now they're getting an income and they lose their Medicaid, they can't afford to do that. So there's, a, there's a, um, a difficulty for people with disability who rely on Medicaid. If they start to work, they may lose their Medicaid. They have to be very careful about not making too much money because they lose their Medicaid. Unless they can find a job of very few people find a job that has, has health insurance. But often people are working part-time they don't have the stamina, the endurance, the ability to work a full-time job. Working part-time, you often don't have health insurance. So income is, is definitely an issue that disability affects income for many people, not all people. Um, education, theoretically, we're all supposed to have access to education. Um, if, however, you need special in order to access education, you need um, an aid to help focus you and keep you on track and tutoring and you need a, um, an occupational therapist maybe to help you with writing or using the computer. Um, you're more likely to get those services. They're available and they're available by law. You're more likely to get those services in, in school districts because the special service people go to those schools. Why do they go to those schools? They come from those neighborhoods, it's easier for them. Everybody wants to work near where they live, so they, where they live. If you live in, um, let's see, if you live in Park Slope, wouldn't you rather work in Park Slope? And so they do, and there are fewer services schools that are in Jamaica, Queens, 
East New York, South Bronx. So they, these children are eligible for services, but the services aren't there. And they don't get them. So there are certainly disabling, can, people with disabilities are at a disadvantage with education, even with the laws that have been enacted that prevent, that prohibit that. Certainly with employment, people discriminate still against with disabilities. Um, we have assumptions, they are present in the workplace. Um, social, I talked about, you, your social environment can be very limited if you have a disability, could be. Um, and the physical environment makes it difficult for people to, to get around, get to a job, get to school, et cetera. Um, so definite to just two different of health disparities. So we're talking, when we're talking about inequality and a disparity, we're talking about um, comparing people with disability to people without disability. People with disability compared to all people without disability. Is there a difference that can't explain away by some other um, factor? And yes, there is. But they're likely to trouble accessing health care. What happens when the person in a wheelchair gets to the doctor's office and they're supposed to get, maybe they can get in, but the doctor I go to for primary care, the, the doorway is very narrow and there's no way a wheelchair is getting through this doorway. And um, there's, a, there's a couple steps up, so some people can get up those steps, but not everybody. And when you get into the doctor's examining office, what do they ask you to do? Been to a doctor? Do you have to get up on a table? And you just hop right up there. There's a little stool, on it, you get up on the table. Were you going to say something else? Hmm? Yeah, the table. So if you can't get on the table, what happens? What if you need a pelvic exam? You're a woman who needs a pelvic exam. Most women who are in wheelchairs never get a pelvic exam because they cannot get on the table. And how will someone do it? Now, does that mean that women with disabilities um, don't, that means that they don't get regular screenings for cancer? So what happens when you don't get regular screenings? If you get cancer, it's identified late. The later a cancer is identified, the more likely it is that you will die from that cancer, that the treatments we have are not be effective. So what happens with, um, none of you probably have ever had a mammogram yet, but you know people. The, the machine, you have to stand there and the machine comes at you. But you have to stand there and ooh, do this, and you do funny movements, and you have to hold your breath, and you have to stand there for a while while they do it. What happens if you can't stand? You don't get a mammogram, all right? Until more recently, there are a few places that have mammograms that go up and down so that they can do it while the person's sitting in a chair rather than standing. The, there are architectural barriers, there are equipment barriers, there are attitude barriers. Lots of people say, whoa, I don't know anything about this wheelchair thing. I can't work with this person. So information problems, resources. Um, can people get places? It's difficult to get to some neighborhoods. It's easier to get to some than others from the person's house. Um, if they have mobility problems. And health insurance is not a problem they have Medicaid. So Medicaid and Medicare, but Medicaid specifically for people with disabilities is, is, um, is at least available to people with low income and disability. It doesn't pay much, so people don't like to accept Medicaid because they don't, and Medicare, because Medicare and Medicaid don't pay a lot, but but you can find at least providers who will take Medicaid and Medicare. Um, so just a graphic of comparing people with disabilities in the dark blue and people without disabilities in the light blue. 
and um, looking at nationally, you know, are there actual differences? And yes, there, there clearly are. Um, some more bigger differences than others. Cardiovascular disease in people with disabilities, much higher. Now, do people with disabilities get extra screening cardiovascular disease and preventive health care and information and, you know, et cetera, how to prevent um, only if they have good health insurance and a really good primary care doctor who's going to do that. Um, quest any questions about why there's such a difference in some of these? The smokers. Yeah. Why? Why would people? Why would people with disabilities be more likely to be smokers, and not have quit, right? And people without disabilities. Yeah. For some reason, people think smoking helps their stress. Does it? I don't know. I, I thought it did when I was in college. I used to smoke. I think it was cool. Maybe everybody did at that time. It's not cool now, but it was then. But people, if like you're doing something with your hands, you're doing something with your mouth, um, and people feel they perceive that it helps with their stress. I'm not sure anybody has shown any real neurophysiological link between smoking and stress, but people perceive that it does. Um, will, will smoking make you poorer? <laughs> Costs a fortune to smoke. So there, people are smoking even though they, don't, they may not have as much money as other people and they're still willing to spend that on cigarettes. Why else might people smoke? No, go ahead, whatever. Yeah, like a secondary kind of condition. There are a lot of secondary conditions that I didn't get into with, with disabilities. Um, sorry. Um, and I don't know if that's exactly what you mean, but if you have diabetes, there are lots of secondary conditions like obesity happens because sometimes because of medications, not with diabetes necessarily, but with other conditions, Especially with mental health conditions. The medication mental health conditions often um, this is what we call metabolic syndrome and, and slows your metabolism down and people gain weight. But obesity is often associated. What it happens with obesity, lower move, you know, lower activity. Um, you know, it, it influence, it increases the circulation and the neuropathy that somebody is, the less they move. Um, so there are a lot of sort of um, conditions that interact with these major kind of health conditions. And, and if you have a spinal cord injury or any kind of injury that you know, produces the inability to use your legs, and you're in a wheelchair, and you're not moving, and you're not feeling, so you have loss of sensation, much higher risk for pressure sores that can get affected, et cetera. So there are lots of secondary things that happen. Um, so you believe me, this is health, there's disparities between people with disabilities and without disabilities. And this is across incomes, all right? They're, they're, they're including everyone so that each group has people of different income levels, et cetera. So we can't explain this on the basis of income level or where you live, et cetera. Um, just another study, national study, people with disabilities in the first column number and people without disabilities in the second column number. And that the internet access I thought was very interesting. People have le less opportunity to get on the internet. They have less resources for information. They have less resources for social support, et cetera. So, um, and income is lower. And this also is taking into account all 
other factors because they measured everybody of any income level, of any ethnicity, any et cetera. So this is without other factors, other factors being equal. And the cancer screening is an excellent example of a place where there was a really dangerous inequity in health for women with mobility limitations. And um, there was a, a fairly strong um, movement and lobbying that went on by disability groups to um, have to increase the knowledge and the, the, the understanding of practitioners, OBGYNs, and mammography places that could get an adjustable height table, people, so they could transfer from the wheelchair to the table, table goes up, do the pap smear. They could get adjustable height mammogram machines and do mammograms for people in wheelchairs. And that if they did, they would get more business because that's where people would go. If they can't get it here, they're going to go to the place where they can get the screening. Um, an interesting thing about that was um, Dr. Booten Foster, is she here? She, she can tell you, but she wrote a, a grant with a um, disability group for studying women with women who use wheelchairs and um, cancer um, identification risk, et cetera, and to NIH. And NIH did not fund their study. And one of the reviewers actually <laughs> comment that this really, there wasn't a real need for this because these are not, these are women who are not um, having babies and they're not sexually active. So, you know, it, they don't see the need for this. So there's a lot of attitudes in the research community about what's important, what's not important. And often people with disability um, are on the short end of that, that stick. But if you, definitely if you get diagnosed at a later stage of cancer, you, um, you're a much, much higher risk for mortality. So, so what can we do? You can recognize people with disability have health inequities. Um, you can help the people where you're working understand how to organize their exam rooms, how to you know, be sensitive to people's needs who have come in with disability, how to talk to people and ask, what do you need? What do you need me to do so that we can, you know, we can really examine you, what, you know, to really look at what kind of problems you're having that might be different from other people who don't have your condition. Um, we can help our colleagues to, to do that. And I, what I've put here are some resources um, that are, first one is the World Health Organization, WHO, um, fact sheets that are very useful t for healthcare providers. So if you're in a healthcare place as an intern or a a practicum and people seem to need some information. The, the WHO site, the DREDF, I don't, I forget what it stands for, and the um, CDC, Center for Disease Control, all have, um, are, are um, specifically directed and towards information for healthcare providers about disability and um, health. And the, the last one has both that, but also information for, um, about dis disabilities, disabling conditions, et cetera, for, for anybody, or for people with the dis disability condition about health that they need to know about their health interacting with that particular condition. Um, I have no idea what time it is. So, um, this is not in your, in your thing because I just saw it today. It just came up on my, on my um, computer. I thought it was really interesting just, to, just to, for discussion. It doesn't have to do with disability necessarily. It has to do with our pitiful healthcare system. But that black one up there, the black line, is the United States. And that's how much we spend compared to other wealthy countries. We're considered a wealthy country. 
we're not all wealthy, but we are a wealthy country. And all the other wealthy countries spend quite a bit less, and our amount compared to them is, is growing much faster than theirs is. On the other hand, oh, this is expenses also on primary care. The other was total health care expense. Primary care, we also are way, way out to the higher end of, of um, expense. And overall health care ranking. So how are we doing with health care when we spend all that money? Are we? The bottom. So I, I don't know. I think people tell us this, but I like to look at it. Um, it helps me to look at it. And you can find this on lit images um, if you want to show it to people. It's, it's very upsetting and depressing. But you, you can get depressed. I can get depressed. Being right, older people are often depressed, right? Aren't they? Is that a, is that a nice generalization for you? But don't get, you get depressed because you can do something about this. Why do you think that's the case? You really you want to know what I think, <laughs> and other people think. Other people think it's not just me, but other people, because all the other wealthy countries have a some form there are different forms so they're very different forms but they all have a form of government regulated single payer system care so it's not a business people don't make money off of health care in the other countries any of them in this country however people become wealthy by owning pharmaceutical companies, companies that run um, nursing homes, companies that offer health insurance. <laughs> what? <laughs> Did I offend somebody? No. Oh. Okay, I can't hear. I mean, this is, it's sad, but I can't. Um, that's my explanation. Because of our capitalist system, which works for business, we somehow separated education until recently. Education is in danger of becoming a business at the moment. So I think you should keep, keep an eye on that and try to stop people from doing it. But if you start getting education, to be a business and people make money off of running charter schools and they have investors who are making money you're going to get into the same problem and, and we don't have such a great education system here compared to these other places either I didn't put those up so don't let that happen but it happened with um, health care and it didn't happen until recently um, parent, I was just reading an article about uh, NFK not a perfect person, but he was about to start, he had done a lot of work on um, the single payer health system for this country. So did Truman. And Kennedy took Truman's plan and worked on it and had enough support in Congress that he probably could have passed it before somebody shot him. Um, so you wonder what might have happened that had passed in the six, early 60s, we would be in a very different place with health care than we are now. Um, but it's, it's because it's a business, in my opinion. <laughs> and I'm not grading you, so it's OK for me to say my opinion. <laughs> we're not supposed to be too outspoken when we're grading people. But you can take it or leave it. Um, but if you have an opportunity to work with a group who's lobbying for a single-payer system or um, what at one of, the, system, one of the, the methods that these other countries use. They're not all the same. Um, I, would, I would work with them. And if you have an opportunity to, and you can use all of this information, that this is going to be you know, helpful for everyone, not just one single group of, of low people or it will be helpful to everybody.
to have better health in this country. And that's the way we used to think about education. Education, everyone should be educated because that's a societal benefit. And it doesn't matter if you see, you shouldn't have better or only access to education. That is not in the, benef in the interest of society. But health is the same thing, I would say. It is in the interest of society. Other questions? Thank you for that question. Um, any questions about disability? There's lots of stuff online, and you can the resources that I put on the, on the handout are, are probably the place to start, and then they link you to other, to other things. Done. <laughs>